you very much. And I estimate we have about 13 minutes for questions. Please keep questions short and concise and no statements. So, hands, please. Alex. Um, just on Henry, Henry, I wanted to ask you a couple of things. What about, um, you talked about consolidations in, in a, in a fiscal consolidations. What about Australia's fiscal consolidation uh, in 1996, okay, the combination of spending and tax changes there, um, relative to the other examples that you talked about. And then you talked about honesty and taxation. What about honesty and spending? I mean, when are we going to tell people that the stuff that's coming is just not affordable? I, well, let me start with your second point and move to your first. Um, you're absolutely right. We need to say that. But one of the best ways of saying that is to actually tax people for it. To say we can't keep spending more than we're earning. And so if we can't cut spending, we're going to have to take more from you. Uh, that's what I regard as honesty. To pretend that we can continue to spend and not adjust the revenue side, that, to my mind, is uh, uh, manifestly uh, dishonest and will simply aggravate all of the problems that we face. On your first question uh, about the Australian consolidation, well, we had two very large ones, um, the Hawke consolidation, or property, better known as the Peter Walsh consolidation of the late 1980s, and, and then the Howard and Costello consolidation of the late 90s. And in both of those, um, increases in revenue were very substantial. Uh, obviously, uh, more so in the, uh, uh, in the Peter Walsh consolidation. But in the, um, uh, in the uh, uh, Howard Costello consolidation, according to a very good presentation by uh, Alex Robson, uh, calculations by Alex Robson. I can give you his email address. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 about 25 to 30 percent of the fiscal effort uh, occurred on the revenue side. And I would say to this government, uh, there is no excuse for placing greater reliance on revenues than Howard and Costello did. So 70 percent of the consolidation should come from spending adjustments. If you need to make a revenue adjustment, do so, but have that photo of Howard and Costello firmly in mind. Question on the front. Uh, Sinclair, I was just going to mention for those beverages that there is no tax free threshold in New Zealand. Um, people pay tax from that sort of word go. Um, uh, and, and, and it's done in part. And I think it came in under the session, uh, yeah. to to make the point that you are receiving services with tax payment. Well, Dr. Chris was always making that point that every New Zealander who benefited from a service should pay tax so that they would know that there is nothing for free. And they don't have capital aspects in New Zealand. Just in the front. Um, could, would you, each of you perhaps, um, address the question of churn? How significant is it and what can be done about it? The best work I saw on churn was by Peter Saunders of the CIS about oh, the early John Humphreys in the early In the early noughties, and Humphreys, yes. Um, in the early noughties, and at that stage he was guesstimating about $80 billion worth of churn was occurring. Um, the, the, I, mean, I agree with the idea that we should tax everybody from dollar one. The issue that Peter actually raised around all of that, of course, was that we're going to be taking money off people and giving it straight back to them um, again. So the, and his argument in favour of the tax free threshold is more or less just administrative convenience. Um, and there's a lot to be said for that, but at the same time, of course, you should be paying for what you're getting. The dealing with the churn argument is an excellent paper by Humphreys um, on his 30-30 proposal, whereby you'd actually eliminate all of that and give people a negative income tax up to 30%, which is far too much, of course. But uh, uh, nonetheless, you know, so, you know, there, there have been, uh, there's a lot of good work done by Peter, unfortunately, 
retired or run off to the UK. I don't know what he's doing or why. But um, <laughs> uh, um, yes, and, and uh, there's a good proposal to deal with. I mean, I think you have to understand that the way the family and tax benefits were constructed was really about politics. So basically, I mean, you could construct a <coughs> Uh, income tax arrangement whereby, <coughs> which took into account, you know, people's dependents and the age of those dependents and the like, and you would therefore eliminate the churn. But this way, people are sort of reminded on a, you know, I guess it's a fortnightly basis, I don't know, having never received anything, um, that, you know, the government is helping you through uh, this, um, uh, ongoing payment, and I mean, I think it really was a, a, a deliberate political choice. I don't think it had anything to do. With it. I'm not sure that's quite right. I mean, I think the the, the problem was that um, I mean, it's a very very long story, and I, I you certainly don't have time for it. I wouldn't bore you with it. But the essence of it was the issue of how you went from a system. That has had a child or, or, or a, 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 a basically a mother's payment as a welfare payment. How you went from that to a situation where, with a rising income tax, you recognised the fact that a person on $100,000 with four children has a different capacity to pay from a person with $100,000 and two children or no children. And the, there were tortuous attempts at doing that as the two systems evolved. And when it came to the 86, 87 tax adjustments and pension check, and uh, payment benefit check, the decision was taken to have means testing of one and partial rebating uh, through the income tax. Mind you, taking into account what essentially privately chosen costs. I mean, if you went and had four kids, good on you, but I'm not sure I want to be necessary to subsidise you. Sorry, Sinclair, I know you've got four children. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think there was also a point when, you know, Howard was giving away those tax sure. cuts because he had so much money, yeah. but he wanted to direct them to people with children, and he, therefore the family tax benefit system was absolutely perfect for that because he put up the rate of payment while not necessarily giving such a big tax cut. So it the like. government to create business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. Yeah. Well, Guys, we're going to run out of time. I'm going to get the hairy eyeball. Um, Taya, one last question. All the others, I'm really sorry. Please arrest the three of us um, outside after the thing. Taya? So as a, tax, as a taxpayer, I feel that it's pretty indulgent of any tax increases while well, we've got wasteful spending or luxury spending yeah. on things like the ABC. Uh, that's, that's a personal view. Personal view from an economic perspective, what is the wasteful spending? What is the spending that is more wasteful or should be cut first? Um, uh, my view is more or less like what Mises' view, that any spending other than national security, national defense, peace, law and order is wasteful spending. Yeah. I think the Audit Commission um, does a reasonable job of going through a range of programs. I, I think you could certainly argue that there were greater efficiencies and savings that were obtainable in those programs. And personally, um, what I am very unconvinced about is uh, the merits of this, the very large amounts that are being spent on climate policies. And, um, I was disappointed that the audit didn't uh, take a much harder look at those policies and, and their consequences. That said, I fear that um, uh, simply reducing that spending uh, would not uh, uh, solve the, 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 or would not remove the inefficiency if what happened was that you reduced spending but imposed even more uh, poorly judged regulations. And the risk at the moment, I think, is that uh, uh, the government, because it's spending constrained, will rely to a much greater extent on regulatory instruments, 
And that makes it very important that people like Judith and Think here and all of you are keeping a very close eye on what's being done on the regulatory front and are ensuring that uh, we really hold the government to account for its promises to reduce the regulatory burden. But I mean, I think there are two ways of looking at it. And one, I mean, of course, to me, there's just waste everywhere. And if you get locked up in the lockout and you're kind of flipping through this thing and you're wondering why they're spending money on some recreational centre in Menangatang, you know, you begin to realise that there is just absolute waste all over the place. Um, but, I, I, you know, I, I, there's just politics in all of this. And I mean, I was very interested, Judy Novak, one of her slides, if you remember she had the number of... Um, public servants. And it seems that what happened is, yes, they went through a period of time when Howard and Costello came in, and yes, they were for a, a, a while able to crunch it back. And then what happened? It all just goes up like this. So you see, I think the way to answer it is this. Always uh, ask yourself, what is the rationale for government spending on these activities? Where there are basically huge private benefits, the, the, you know, the rationale for governments being involved in this is very, very small. And that, that, I think, is you need some sort of theoretical framework to guide you, as opposed to, you know, clearly it's just money wasted all over the shop, which is a true bit hard to get at. Okay, John Sals, we, we can actually squeeze in one more question. So the gentleman at the back, yes, you? Yeah. Oh, right. tax, which actually makes it easy for governments to collect taxes. Now, if we wanted to actually cut taxes and, and, and make the costs of income tax incredibly obvious to people, we would do away with withholding tax. We would require people to pay their taxes in cash <laughs> at the ATO. In coins. In coins. Well, well <laughs> I'm, I'm more than happy to give plastic Australian dollar notes back to the federal government because if they inflate the currency, they're only getting it back. Um, but so, um, if, if we were to pay our taxes in cash in Canberra, um, people would know the true cost of running the government. And uh, um, I don't know if they still do this in Hong Kong, but for a long time they did do it in Hong Kong. And not only did you pay your, your, your taxes in cash, if you didn't have the cash, you could borrow the money from the bank. And the bank actually had a publicized rate. If you were borrowing money to pay your taxes, that was the rate that you paid. So when a Hong Kong politician talks about raising taxes, everybody immediately knows how much they're going to pay and what, what rate of interest they're going to be paying on that cash. And there's a lot to be said for that. So uh, making it easy for the government to skin us alive is always a mistake. And I think we need to remember that.